Hello, and welcome to another chemistry lesson on chemical equilibrium. Now, this is going to be lesson number seven, and I want you to make sure you're taking very careful notes today. So at this time, pause the video, take out a notebook and a pencil, or perhaps take out your phone and take notes using the note-taking app. And also, I would like for you to maybe even use Word, a Word document on your computer or Google Docs. Let's begin. Today we're going to be talking about what is a chemical reaction and how does it reach equilibrium. So what is the difference between a physical and a chemical reaction? This is something we covered earlier in the year. A physical reaction we see on the left and a chemical reaction is something we see on the right. What is the primary difference between these two? So a physical reaction is we still have the same matter or the same molecule and it's just changed its physical state. So taking liquid water, for instance, and making it into a gas, or taking a liquid water and changing it into a solid. Now we can always change that water back. So technically speaking, no, no big change. But over here on the right-hand side, we see that wood being burned into a pile of ash to make fire. That is a chemical reaction. Unless you're Thanos and have the time stone, you cannot reverse this ash back into wood. So this is a chemical reaction. We've created something new. Now, what is a chemical equilibrium? Uh, the other lesson we were talking about, something very similar. So the definition is that this occurs in a closed system in which the chemical change is completely reversible. So in our previous lecture, we talked about this, a flask that has a stopper on it with water and we have water that's evaporating into a water vapor and sticking to the sides of the flask and eventually condensating back down into a liquid state. This is an equilibrium because we're always going to have the same amount of liquid water as we have as a water vapor. So it's reversible. We're able to turn it around. An example is when we take nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and we do a forward reaction and we make ammonia but that ammonia can actually break down as a gas back into nitrogen and hydrogen. So here is the difference between just a plain old chemical reaction that we saw with the wood over here on the right-hand side turning into ash. We can't really reverse that. But in a chemical equilibrium reaction in a closed system, we actually can have the ammonia reversing its reaction and splitting apart into nitrogen and hydrogen again. So the rate of the forward and reverse reactions will be equal in this state. Concentrations of nitrogen and hydrogen gas and ammonium will also remain constant in the same state. And remember that this is the symbol for equilibrium. The top arrow up here is going to be our forward reaction and the bottom arrow right here is going to be our reverse reaction. Now the arrows mean together that this is in equilibrium. So quick question for you. What will happen to the left penguin over here if the right penguins eat 100 of the fish? Yeah, there's going to be stress. There's gonna be stress caused on this balance right here, on the fulcrum of the balance because these penguins are gonna be catching a whole lot more fish and adding a whole lot more weight to the reaction. We're gonna to start to see one side of this reaction begin to outweigh the other side and we're no longer gonna have the equilibrium we're looking for. So we're gonna learn a little bit about what happens when stress is added to a reaction at its equilibrium. A stress is defined as any change in concentration temperature or pressure to an equilibrium reaction. Now, you can look at the scales here. One side or the other is experiencing stress, so we're actually having a little bit of that equilibrium being passed back and forth. When stress is introduced into a reaction at equilibrium, the reaction will change by speeding up in one direction while it's slowing down in the other direction and it's going to bring it back 
to equilibrium. So with one way that it flows, it will always be coming back the other way. So changing concentration or temperature in a reaction is pretty darn important because as we saw in the digital lab that was assigned earlier last week, we saw that an increase in concentration or an increase in temperature does have a variable effect on how fast a reaction will take place. So when we have nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas going into ammonium, we actually have, look, we have heat and it's being released. So increasing any reactant such as nitrogen gas, it's going to increase the forward reaction. So when we increase the concentration of nitrogen gas on this side, we're going to be increasing and shifting the reaction over. This increases the product concentrations. So it's going to increase the amount of ammonium we, we create by increasing the concentration of a reactant. So with more nitrogen, we're gonna end up having more ammonium. And it's going to decrease the reverse reaction, that bottom arrow, it's going to decrease how fast we're gonna go back into having nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. So this is going to decrease the concentration of all the other reactants. But in contrast, if we increase the product, if we put more ammonia in there, it's going to increase the reverse reaction. So we're gonna be shifting a lot more to the left. This arrow is gonna be pumping that ammonium gas into the reactants instead, and they're gonna be splitting apart more often. So this is going to increase reactant concentration as we get a, a degradation of this ammonium gas into its reactants. So this decreases that forward reaction arrow, and we're not gonna see as much ammonium from the reactants being made. Instead, we're gonna see more of the ammonium turning into the nitrogen and hydrogen. So the decrease of concentration of all other products, such as heat, because the heat was released when we had these two forming the bond to become ammonia. If we increase heat or temperature, it favors to speed up the endothermic reaction. So the endothermic reaction is us taking in a little bit of heat on that forward reaction. And decreasing heat or temperature, it favors the speed up of the exothermic reaction or when we are doing the reverse reaction. So really quick, I wanna give you a learning check. Given the reaction at equilibrium, SO2 plus NO2, both as gases, the forward reaction is leading us to SO3 gas plus NO. Now these two are in fact balanced, so you don't need to do any stoichiometry here. Which change causes the equilibrium to shift to the right? Is it decreasing the concentration of NO2? Decreasing the pressure of the reaction? Increasing the concentration of SO2? Or increasing the temperature? So we're wondering, once again, which is going to cause the equilibrium of this reaction to shift to the right? So what's gonna cause all of this shift, a forward style reaction to the right? Is it gonna be decreasing the concentration of a reactant? Is it gonna be decreasing the pressure of the reaction? Is it gonna be increasing the concentration of one of the reactants over here on the left side? Or is it gonna be increasing the temperature of the reaction overall? Very good. So the answer was letter C, because as we increase the concentration of reactants on the left-hand side, we're gonna actually see this reaction speed up in a forward style reaction. And even though it's at equilibrium, and it will remain that way, we're able to kind of shift it and stress that reaction. Remember that word stress with the penguins on the fulcrum or the balance. 
we're going to cause it to come off of its fulcrum and go a little bit towards the right for a little bit. And we're going to actually be creating more of the products over here on the right-hand side. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this helped clarify some stuff about stress and chemical equilibrium within reactions. If you have any questions, make sure to ask your teacher or to leave a comment on this Google Classroom assignment.